you know, Jeremy, you're a little on the hot seat here. You're, de you're defending the algorithms and um, your field. And so I wanted to see if you could start off with a little bit of a take on what William and, and Ravi presented from the perspective of someone who's trying to do this in the field. Okay. The, the report that was released was really important because it, uh, it points out something that is absolutely true, right? Which is that drug enforcement is biased and using drug incident data to make forecasts is a bad thing, period, right? But that's not actually what's being done in the police departments that are adopting predictive technologies. To my knowledge, no one's actually modeling drugs and using that to target particular communities. They're using things like robberies and burglaries and assaults and homicides and things like that. And the nature of the generation process for the data is very different for those types of incidents compared to the drug activity. If you are a, um, if the way that uh, drug incidents get generated is that the police have to go through a process of figuring out how they can nab someone for a particular drug problem, right? That means that they have a lot of enforcement decisions to make that could lead to biases. Whereas something like a robbery, for example, um, police officers are not walking down the street and conjuring up new robberies, right? Uh, it's the, the victim reporting it to the police department, and then that turns into a crime report. If anything, there's actually a lot of pressure on police departments to suppress those numbers because that's what they're judged on in terms of UCR numbers. So um, I think it's a very important contribution to, to point this out. I don't think it necessarily reflects the way that things are actually playing out. So uh, what I think would be a great next step would be to actually repeat the analysis with things like robberies and burglaries and compare kind of how that disparity uh, exists and how we might be able to address like underreporting of crime, for example. Uh, because again, it is reported crime. However, the, the populations that are most likely to be underreporting crime are in fact the minority communities themselves. And this is supported by victimization surveys and things like that. And so it'd be interesting to figure out how we can get a more accurate picture of crime. However, that might not necessarily align with that what we're trying to address right now, which is to de in decrease disparity uh, among minority and uh, communities. Well, I guess I would say that um, I actually have heard this comment that, uh, that you know, drug crimes are not actually used in modeling uh, in, within police departments. Um, but I think that wasn't the point. I don't think that we, I think we were aware of that going in. I think part of the, the, part of the, the issue for us was that we wanted to show types of crimes that we, we could actually get estimates independent of police recorded data to actually model against, right? So we, so I, I would agree that, I, you know, I don't think from my knowledge, I haven't heard police departments actually use this for drug crime. But I will say that the uh, NIJ actually just released, they're having a forecasting contest, and one of the categories of the crimes that they're using and they're counting as a measure of accuracy are drug crimes or vice crimes. So perhaps maybe that drug crimes are not being currently used by police departments now, but I don't think that's going, to, if you have a hammer, you're gonna nail whatever, whatever you can see. So it seems to me like the, one of the um, key things that all of you are talking about is the fact that police data is non-representative. <laughs> and <laughs> so, I mean, this seems like a fundamental challenge to using it. <laughs> and so I guess I would, um, I, I know our next panel has uh, the police data initiative where they're trying to collect data from, the White House is trying to get all these data, police departments to give us data sets and we can hopefully use that to start building some more objective data. But I guess I, before we go to questions, I just want to throw it out to you guys, like how, how can we get, um, I mean, it seems like either we have to find representative data or we have to do some tricks like Ravi is describing to overcome the non-representativeness of, of the data and is one better than the other or one more achievable? Um, I actually, I think we were talking about this before the panel began, but I think there's kind of this kind of a false dichotomy between whether we have a future that's completely human decision making based or machine decision making based. I truly think the future is going to be some hybrid of the two. And part of that is when I think anyone who works with data or who is a data analyst, if you work with a data set long enough, you know like the hidden secrets, you know the problems, the faults. So whenever you're making decisions based on you say, okay, you know what, I know that this is a factor. 
I know this is an issue I need to address. So I need to take steps to correct it or address it. Part of the problem is that we haven't talked about these issues because uh, you know, a lot of this data collection wasn't done with prediction in mind. It wasn't done with analytics in mind. It was done to meet legal requirements and usually for reporting requirements. And so we're moving towards this error where we actually see, OK, we can do more things with these tools. So we perhaps need to think about how the data is collected, what we know about the biases that result from this collection process, and how we can factor that in the subsequent steps. I would say one thing that um, Getting to more representative data is, is definitely a good thing, right? That gives us a more accurate picture of what's happening. But um, if we focus on things like calls for service data or incident data that is not uh, police initiati initiated, um, I would to some degree argue that that actually makes sense for the police to use um, to allocate resources because that is the public requesting services. And so this idea that the police would align where they do their work with where the community is asking for services makes some sense to me. Um, and so if you're trying to like figure out like how many drug users there are, right, that's like not the way to do that. You want to figure out like through victimization surveys and other surveys like what the real rate of drug abuse is, for example, to know what the complete picture is. But if you think about from the perspective of uh, you know, where is there a, uh, a drug problem that the community perceives, right? You could use public reports of complaints about drugs to give the police department an indication of that. And I would argue that that is actually a meaningfully biased data set in the sense that it is biased to where the community believes the problem exists. Interesting new source of data, um, which is being used by cities across the United States, which is sensor-derived um, data. For example, ShotSpotter, it's a private company that um, has deployed uh, parts of New York City, um, for example, but also many other cities across the United States with uh, microphone arrays that can detect um, and localize gunfire. And so, you know, it's not, uh, it's not clear, I would say, how accurate these, these systems are, but um, the, the makers of these tools sort of promise that they kind of, uh, you know, are, are the, the happy medium between, um, you know, citizen reports, uh, let's say, of gunfire and, and police, police reports. Um, something to think about. Yes, um, so I think, yes, I think in the perfect world, I think, yes, call for service might reflect demand, but I think, I think we just brought up the issue of underreporting, right? I think, you know, there are communities that feel hesitant to call the police for a variety of reasons. I think a lot of the instances we see with policing, maybe some individuals don't or do. But I will say, there's also the other side of it. So I was, you know, there's reading, there's a Washington Post article about the role of gentrification in in policing. So when you have a new population moving into a neighborhood, right, they perceive that the previous residents are somehow a threat. And so what call for service might mean is it might change over time and it might reflect, well, we have new gentrified residents who are now calling the police and saying, we need more enforcement of the people who used to, let's say, walk in the alleyways behind row houses to get home because that's what they did for 20 years. But now, that rather than it just being a shortcut, now it's trespassing. Right? And so then the nature of policing changes. But I would say that in that sense, if you're just looking for the calls for service data, you're not actually picking that, that trend up. Right? You're, you're just picking up, well, there's a lot more demand for this, so obviously this, there's some real issues here. And it might be more than just crime. It might be there's cultural shifts going on. And that's why you do need to have a human-machine approach because you need to have, let's say, police officers going to communities saying, OK, what's going on? And I think even from the report itself, they said the cops realize this at, at, at a qualitative level. They say, look, this is a lot of people who just moved to the neighborhood. They don't know how it works, and they keep on calling us. But because they call, we have to go out and respond. And that's, then that's actually another data point that's generated. And so, and so I think we have to be careful by assuming that there's a silver bullet. I think there needs to be more balance in the approach because there's lots of things that data doesn't pick up. <laughs>